well, thanks for coming out on this dreary day so early in the morning. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so uh, why talk about the Occupy movement at this point? I mean, for all intents and purposes, it seems to be defunct as a movement. Um, parks are empty, no encampments. Uh, the protesters don't seem to have a very public presence at this point. But I think it made an, uh, a lasting impact on public discussion of our economic situation. Features of our economic lives that the Occupy movement highlighted continue to be a focus for discussion, particularly in this election season. It still makes sense, therefore, to ask what Christians should make of the movement, and I'll offer my own view about this in a minute. I've been trying for some time in my work as a theologian to suggest that Christians have something distinctive to say about economic issues, that their own basic beliefs and practices indeed give them a particular take on economic life that contained within a Christian account of God and God's relations with the world, one can find an integrated, coherent vision of economic life, one that abides by unusual economic principles for production, distribution, and exchange. Un for example, unconditional and therefore in principle universal provision of the goods that have their source in God's own life, according to a fundamentally non-competitive understanding of possession and use. Unusual principles, unusual economic principles, yes. One can bring this uh, Christian vision of economic life to bear in fruitful ways, I think, on almost any economic matter facing us in our daily lives and I'm going to try to give you an example of that today, how it provides what I think is a new angle on the Occupy movement, so a new angle on it. I'll try to show that uh, Christians have good reason to be supportive of the, of the Occupy movement, what it stood for, and not simply for the obvious religious reasons. What would those more obvious religious reasons be? Well, uh, Christian concerns about social justice, Christian concerns especially for the poor, for all those disadvantaged and downtrodden, marginalized and harmed by forms of social exclusion and exploitation. Those concerns clearly overlap with the issues that the Occupy movement brought to the forefront of our national consciousness. Economic inequity and the economic plight of the 99% underserved by our political and economic system since the financial crisis hit. There's every reason for the two, Christianity and the Occupy movement, to be closely aligned on these grounds alone of shared concern. Concerns about injustice and about the economic disadvantage suffered by so many. But more than this, I believe that the basic beliefs of Christianity contain, as I've just suggested an alternative vision of economic life that can help make sense of and pull together the multiple strands of our economic and political predicament targeted for protest by the Occupy movement. So that's what I want to talk about today. So uh, what is this alternative vision of our economic lives? What were the multiple concerns of the Occupy protest? How does that Christian vision of economy help pull those multiple pr uh, strands of the protest together? That's what I want to try to lay out for you this morning very briefly. That's a lot to do. Uh, first, let me just say something about this uh, alternative vision of economy that Christianity provides. One major aspect of that vision, which lies, I believe, at the very heart of Christian belief, is the lifting up of the idea of a society of mutual benefit. A society organized from the start to ensure that everyone benefits at the same time from the same resources, the same sources of wealth generation. 
a society in which we benefit together from wealth produced rather than alone. Not simply a society in then in which some have a lot and generously redistribute to others less fortunate them, than themselves some of what they have in order to equal things out a bit. A society of philanthropic giving, not just that, but an economy in which it makes no sense to benefit alone without others benefiting too. An economy where the mechanisms of wealth generation are organized from the start in mutually beneficial ways. No? Okay. Uh, I think a host of very basic Christian beliefs about God's own life and about how God shares God's life with the world contain within them this kind of a vision of a society of mutual benefit. So let me just give you some examples of Christian beliefs that seem to be holding up this alternative vision of economic life. Here's the theological part. Get ready. Okay. Uh, it's early in the morning. We're ready. Theo theology. Um, here are some examples. You know, I'm basically uh, interpreting some very basic Christian beliefs, giving them an economic spin of a kind so that you'll see that uh, what I'm talking about as a society of mutual benefit is what uh, these Christian beliefs are already talking about. The Trinity. What each person of the Trinity has, the others have as well. The very same divine life is common to them all. No one member of the Trinity can enjoy the good of divine life without the others also partaking in it. The good of divine life is produced within one member of the Trinity only as that divine life is circulated to the others and found within them as well. And as the good of the divine life circulates among them, that good never leaves any one of them. They all continue to have what they're providing to the others. Hey, I think that sounds like a society of mutual benefit. What do you think? In Christian accounts of the incarnation, one finds this same sort of vision of community enjoined for the very purpose of ensuring mutual enjoyment of goods circulating among its different parties in the incarnation, those different parties being God, the divinity of Christ on the one hand, and the humanity of Christ on the other. Without losing what God has, God becomes incarnate in Christ to provide to the humanity of Christ what God continues to enjoy, eternal life, for example by way of their close community with one another in the person of Christ. Both the humanity of Christ and Christ's divinity come to enjoy, to benefit from, the same divine goods, the same divine wealth, so to speak, of eternal life. The God incarnate in Christ doesn't lose divine life by providing it to, by producing it within Christ's own resurrected and glorified humanity. And the humanity of Christ cannot benefit from divine life alone without the divinity of Christ with which it's joined continuing to enjoy it. To the contrary, this is a community between divine and human designed from the very start just to produce mutual enjoyment of the same goods. Mm. And similarly with other human beings enjoyment of what God offers to them in Christ. What God gives to one person by way of Christ, God can also give to others. This is no zero-sum game. The very life of God can be distributed to all without anyone coming to benefit at the expense of another. Indeed, the more that I'm saved simply by God's free grace, the less I have reason to expect to be saved alone. Mine becomes a destiny potentially shared with all others, irrespective of any differences in circumstance or individual merits or demerits that might set us apart. What, like, what might lead me to question my own salvation is the limited character of God's mercy. The more I seem to be saved alone, the more reason I have to question the generosity of God upon which I depend for my own salvation. So that gives, I hope, gives you some sense of the basic shape of this community of mutual benefit and the way that it could be supported theologically, the way that, the way that you can find it in very basic Christian beliefs. All right, that's that part of things. Now, what were the multiple concerns of the Occupy movement, and how might this Christian vision of an economy of mutual fulfillment and benefit help make sense of them, help integrate them, bring them into a coherent picture of the problems we face as a nation. 
Well, among those multiple concerns of the movement, first of all, was a, let's make that first, a worry about democracy. The Occupy movement tapped into the suspicion that our democracy is not really of the people anymore. We suspect our chosen representatives are not really working for us. We seem to have little ability to influence policy through them. That's the, that's the suspicion. Democracy needs to be reconceived, and that's what the general assembl assemblies of the Occupy movement were, seemed to be about, uh, an experiment in genuinely participatory democracy. The little hope that organizers had uh, in our supposedly democratic polity was one reason why this movement, unlike other movements for change, had no clear policy recommendations to make. It was not so much trying to influence the powers that be as trying to empower people to take control of their own lives and come to their own decisions in the very process of constructing new forms of political life together, the general assemblies being the case in point. A second major concern of the movement was wealth inequality uh, captured in the now famous slogan, we are the 99%. The 99% who don't seem to be benefiting economically from the present system. Whatever economic growth there has been over the last few decades seems to have gone disproportionately to those at the top. That's what uh, the slogan was pointing out. And clearly the movement was drawing a connection between this wealth inequality and the failure of democracy. This is a suspicion that we don't live in a genuine democracy, but in an oligarchy of the wealthy. Money buys influence, given the current state of campaign finance law, especially after the recent Citizens United Supreme Court decisions, and given the extent of corporate lobbying in Washington. A third major concern was the new economy of debt and risk management, finance. Finance dominated capitalism, concern about the financial crisis in 2008, and about the government response to it and its aftermath aftermath, concern, for example, about the continue, continued indebtedness of ordinary Americans, particularly of students forced to finance their education through huge loans, backed by the government, but at interest rates that don't seem to fully re reflect those guarantees and then that are therefore higher than need be. This concern about the financial system uh, seemed to have been one galvanizing focus for the movement that helped in great part to bring together its other two concerns. Consider the slogan commonly chanted, banks got bailed out, we got sold out. Sold out, betrayed by the very people chosen to represent us. The fact that banks got bailed out and we got sold out makes clear that we don't, would make clear that we don't live in a genuine democracy of the people. And it would also be a prime example of the inequalities of a grossly inequitable sort that the movement protested. The slogan was pointing out what easily appears to be an outrageous inequality of treatment on the economic front. Some people, little people, most of the people still have to pay their debts when things go sour, when the housing market collapses and their homes are worth less than their mortgages. While powerful, while powerful banks, their debts are immediately forgiven despite the fact that it was their lax and sometimes even predatory lending pro uh, practices that got us into the mess to begin with. Okay, those are the three concerns of the Occupy movement and the way that they're brought together to some extent uh, within the movement uh, itself, although the movement remained very uh, undefined uh, for reasons that I mentioned. Now, how does coming at this whole complex of issues from a Christian point of view make a difference? Yeah, I'd like to suggest something of that sort. Well, I'm suggesting that uh, that Christian vision of an economy of mutual benefit helps put all these concerns together into a coherent picture by leading one to ask whether there isn't some system of wealth production in place here, some underlying form of profit generation giving rise to the wealth disparities. So look at the wealth inequalities and consider their original causes, the economic system that underlies and produces them to begin with. From the Christian point of, point of view I laid out for you a minute ago, it doesn't make sense to assume too quickly that the problem here is simply a failure to redistribute wealth. 
through more progressive taxation, say. That the problem here is that the wealthy don't pay their fair share in taxes, for example. That, that, well, that seems to be the, the real focus for political discussion. I'm suggesting that, you know, that it a, 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 kind of misses the underlying uh, central worry here. Once prompted by the Christian vision of a society of mutual benefit to ask what is creating the prior wealth disparities to begin with before taxes come into the picture. In other words, mightn't there be some fundamental problem with the original system of distribution, some problem with the system of wealth creation, and not simply a problem with the processes for redistributing wealth from the already wealthy to the less well off? Yeah. And here I think the finger can be pointed at finance-dominated capitalism, that third prong of the Occupy protests, for reasons that I'll go into in a minute. Moreover, it's because the underlying system of pro profit generation is so skewed to benefit only a small proportion of the population that it requires undemocratic trends in politics if it's to be put in place and held in place. So you begin to see how things hang together. In order for all this to make sense, one needs to be clear about what sort of wealth inequalities one is talking about here. One isn't primarily talking about income gaps across the whole economic spectrum, whole income spectrum, say between the poor and the middle class, that possible gap, or between the educated and the not so well educated, that kind of gap, but specifically about the gap between the very wealthiest 1% or even the richest one-tenth of a percent, even the richest one-hundredth of a percent, and everybody else between the very top and everyone else, including the poor and the middle class, including the educated and the uneducated. That's where the huge gap is between the very top and everybody else. And it isn't the income or wealth disparity per se that's the primary issue, but the fact of income and wealth concentration at the very top. So the worry isn't so much or just the fact that a CEO of a company might make 400 times the average uh, uh, wage of uh, the employees of that company. The worry is that a disproportionate amount of the wealth to go around in that co company is concentrated at the top with everyone else making relatively little or no gains from profit generated. On the question of wealth concentration for the country as a whole, the current figures as is, are as high as the richest 1% holding 39 to 40% of the national wealth and 25% of the national income. Quite an increase from the figures from 2007 before the financial crisis hit, which showed the top 1% holding 18% of the share of national income in any one year and 25% if counting capital gains from investments and dividends. The richest one in a thousand of the people at that time holding over 12% of the national income and the richest one in 10,000 holding 6% of the national income. The, cumula the cumulative result of all this over the years is that the 1% of the population at the top of the economic pyramid now holds as much wealth as the rest of the population put together or at least they hold as much as uh, what 90% of the rest hold, whatever the exact figures the bottom line is that over the last 30 years, the income and wealth of everyone else has been holding fairly steady, sometimes even declining, especially after the latest financial crisis, while the income and wealth of the top tier has been ballooning, multiplying several times over. So yeah, the, the worry here is that the 99% uh, in short are being left out, left behind. That's the, the primary issue. What a Christian vision of an alternative economy of mutual benefit makes you ask is what sort of system for wealth generation is this in which 1% can make enormous wealth while everyone else is standing in place? That's the real question. Clearly, this is a system for wealth generation that brings with it no impetus to spread that wealth to begin with through, say, full employment at good wages across the board. I mean, that's the underlying issue here. And what system are we talking about here, I'd say, with the Occupy movement and its third prong of protest, that it has everything to do with a finance-dominated form of capitalism? So basically, yeah, just to 
make clear here. Yeah, that this alternative uh, Christian vision of economy is telling you to look for fundamental structures, underlying structures and organizations for the production of wealth and to, and to uh, ask you uh, to think about the one that we've got now and what might be unusual about it, that this fact that the 1% could concentrate wealth in this way uh, while everyone else is being left behind. So yeah, what system are we talking about here? Finance dominated, uh, a finance dominated form of capitalism. Um, capitalism in which finance doesn't dominate, but where finance is simply instead an instrument of production, providing uh, needed loans, say, for investment in equipment or to cover store inventories. That sort of capitalism in which finance does not dominate is dependent for profit generation on increasing demand for the goods and services produced. If there aren't sufficient numbers of people with the money to buy those goods and services, the whole economy is in trouble, finance included, because the money to pay back loans for, to businesses is generated in the same way, ultimately through the profits generated from selling the goods and services produced by these companies. Just because it's dependent in this way on demand, this form of capitalism, a capitalism in which finance doesn't dominate, for all its tendencies to exploit labor wherever possible, has an interest in widespread employment at wage levels permitting increased consumption. I mean, you gotta have that. Um, where, finance, where finance separates from the production process and becomes a preferred means of profit generation in its own right, that's what I mean by finance-dominated capitalism, where, for example, speculation on the ups and downs of a currency become much more profitable than building and selling anything, Profit generation is no longer dependent on demand in the same way, and the link with widespread, well-paid employment is severed. Especially if you consider financial trading that simply involves bets on the rise or fall in value of some asset, or bets on the spread between assets, or financial trading that takes the form of arbitrage, in which money is made off the inconsistent valuations of the same asset or financial product across different markets. Um, the difference, say, between what it will cost you to purchase dollars in Hong Kong and in Britain. There's an enormous amount of money to be made in finance, even when overall economies are in very bad shape with massive unemployment and high levels of even dire poverty. It doesn't matter what's going on in the real economy, there's as much money to be made in finance as ever. Moreover, it's not simply that enormous amounts of money can be made by the few while everyone else is left behind and left out. It's quite possible to make money off their dire straits. In short, the exclusion of large numbers of people from economic well-being becomes a source of profit in finance-dominated capitalism. The subprime mortgage mess, for example, was aided and abetted by the fact of lots of low-income low folks out there that one could get higher than average mortgage rates from. The highest possible interest rate was important even though it signaled that uh, the risk of default on these loans was higher than average because one intended to use financial derivatives to repackage the loans for sale to others. What attracted those buyers was the higher, th the higher than average interest rate. And by bundling and selling the mortgages, one fobbed the higher risk of default onto them in any case. When the values and practices of finance become dominant in corporate culture, as they have over the past 30 years, there's a similar effect. Profit and the hardship of others become directly linked. What matters is the quarterly increase in the share price of the stock of one's company, and that must be jacked up by every possible means, by cutting wages, firing employees, slashing benefits. Even when this is not particularly good for the long-term health of the enterprise and certainly not all that good for your workforce. CEOs and other shareholders can, ca can cash out from rising stock values that are in this way often directly correlated with the worsening situation of workers. The financial finagling of private equity firms can produce similar results, doesn't have to, but it can. Companies are often targeted for hostile takeover when their assets individually are worth more than their stock valuation. 
Money for investors can be made quickly in such a case simply by selling off those company assets with obviously dire consequences for the health of otherwise profitable businesses and their workforce. Takeovers like this are often fin financed by borrowing, and these debts then appear on the balance sheets of the acquired companies, increasing those, the company's expenses and f forcing even, even further wage benefit and workforce cuts if these companies are to stay in business. National priorities that favor finance are another case in, port, a case in point where financial profit seems to be based on even to require the worsening condition of the real economy. The economic cir circumstances that help maintain the value of loans, say low, infa low inflation and high interest rates, are often the very things that depress economic growth. If you've got very high in interest rates, yes, economic growth is going to be difficult to pull off. Similarly, economic measures that make it more likely that a country will be able to pay back its creditors are not conducive to economic growth. If countries in debt to foreign creditors are going to be able to pay back those loans, these countries need to amass foreign uh, reserves, uh, reserves of foreign, that, that foreign currency, say by buying up U.S. treasuries that pay low interest even when that money might be better used on investment in their own countries for infrastructure or education. Or those countries must increase their ratio of exports to imports to raise their foreign reserves, even that, when that means depressing their own domestic economies and decreasing thereby the spending power of their own population in order to do so. The international financial community has often tried to keep countries from deflating their currencies to make their exports more attractive, even though export-driven growth might be the only way for these countries to stimulate their economies, because deflating their currencies raises the chance of default on foreign loans. Even when countries aren't in debt to foreign creditors, governments more worried about having the money to pay back their creditors than being able to spur growth will slash budgets and raise taxes. Such austerity measures, uh, I believe, uh, along with Nouriel Roubini, Joseph Stiglitz, et cetera, these austerity measures are simply a, re a recipe for worsening recession. And uh, yeah, something like that seems to be taking shape uh, in Europe right now. Finally, financial derivatives are typically ways of making money off of volatility in asset prices. They're often just forms of betting on these ups and downs of the stock market, say. And volatility of all those sorts, all these sorts, can be directly correlated with economic distress on the part of companies and working people. It's very hard to do business, for example, when commodity prices and currency values across all the markets one company, one's company does business in are swinging wildly from day to day. Any one of those swings can spell ruin. No one with a private uh, retirement plan needs to be reminded about the hardships that stock market swings can portend and the difficulties that fluctuations in oil and food prices represent for whole populations are equally obvious. But without volatility of these sorts, there's simply no money to be made in financial derivatives. And indeed, the bigger the swings, the better, since derivatives often just involve betting on those swings. One might argue to the contrary that derivatives, these uh, innovative financial products, are designed to help people cope with these sorts of swings. Derivatives pro provide companies, for example, with ways of hedging against the hardships that volatility can bring. If an airline is afra afraid that the price of jet fuel is going to go up, go through the roof, that airline can contract for the option of buying jet fuel at a certain price in future. If that target price proves wrong and the price of jet fuel when the time rolls around is lower, we can simply not exercise the option and we'll have, one will have lost only what one paid for the contract. So it seems all well and good. Or one might argue that derivatives help bring volatility down. For example, by signaling to market participants what those investing in derivatives think an asset is likely to be worth in future. But there's plenty of evidence to suggest that derivatives, rather than deflating the costs of volatility or bringing volatility down, 
serve instead to foment the very volatility they promise to protect market participants from. And eventually, in so doing, produce some of the wildest swings from boom to complete bust. The derivatives that repackaged mortgages worked in that way with that result. The market for those derivatives helped propel the uh, mortgage market for risky loans. And that easy credit to even high-risk borrowers helped inflate housing prices. Anybody could get a house. Demand surged, which prompted more people to buy, to build houses, and more people to refinance and take out bigger second mortgages and get further into debt. And then the whole thing collapsed when the rising price of housing became more than people could afford, and the glut of new houses on the market eventually surpassed demand, and yeah, kaboom. More simply, betting on the decline or upswing in value of some asset when a lot of people follow your lead and do the very same thing as typically happens in financial markets produces the very decline or upswing predicted and much more of one than one would, uh, than would, would otherwise be justified by the underlying problem with the asset or favorable news about it that got anyone to bet that way to begin with. So bigger swings are the result with greater fallout for others. OK, hope I've convinced you. Maybe not. We'll see in the question period. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, if this is the sort of economy you have, uh, one that works to the disadvantage of the majority of the people, you've got to be worried about democracy. Uh, I wouldn't be, be worried here. Wealthy interests benefiting from such an economic system would have every reason to use their money to take contro uh, control of the reins of democratic government. And once they gain that control, to use the powers of government to squelch dissent and the potential social unrest that an economic system like this could very well help to instigate. In short, wealthy interests would have every reason, if given the chance, to push democracy in highly undemocratic directions. One might indeed be led to ask an even more fundamental question. If an economic system dominated by finance is not good for so many people, how could it have been set up and how could it continue to be sustained in a democracy? And the easy, is, the easy answer is uh, that this is all happening because we don't live in a very vibrant or uh, genuine democracy any longer and haven't for some time. An economic system like this that disadvantages so many people could not be helped into place by government action and inaction, for example, by Congress's repeal of Glass-Steagall, which separated commerce, commercial from investment banking, or by Congress's passing of the Commodities Future Moder Modernization Act in 2000, which for all intents and purposes prohibited regulation of derivatives. Such a system couldn't be kept in place, and such a system couldn't be kept in place if our political system really were in the business of serving the will of the people. Calls of distress by the vast, uh, vast majority of the people often seem to go unheeded in Washington, while the demands of those with money are heard loud and clear. That what's, that's what seems to be already happening. We're talking here about money obviously not just concentrating wealth, but concentrating political power. The public and the media are, seem to be distracted by elections, and uh, I mean, they're the, the exclusive focus, and um, the public and the media don't seem to focus on any of the policy debates once the elections are over. Um, and there's so much obfuscation out there about what's at the root of our economic problems, too much regulation, not enough. Uh, and very li little lively and informed public discussion of the issues which anyone pays attention to when actual policy comes to be made in Washington. Um, and that was, I think, the beauty of the Occupy movement. It helped people, uh, got people to open their eyes, tried to get them to wake up, change the national conversations in ways that might enliven our public discourse and help 
move our democracy in more genuinely and broadly participatory directions. Uh, so there you have it. Yeah. Um, my perspective on the concerns of the Occupy movement, what they have to do with one another from a Christian standpoint, how I make sense of the movement as a theologian, the sort of contributions I like, I'd like to make to the discussion from a Christian theological vantage point. I hope, that, I hope it all made some sense. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'm eager for your questions. Thank you.